Alright guys, Dominic here for Kit Guru, and today we are taking another look at the Corsair One i500 that launched earlier this week. You may have already seen that we did get a review up for launch day, however it's safe to say we got a fair few comments around that review, particularly in regards to the cooling, and I know Debauer as well released his own video which had some additional findings, which I want to dive into in a bit more detail in today's video. Today then, I'm going to show you all of our in-depth thermal tests along with new data such as GPU VRM thermals, fan and even CPU cooler swaps so you can see all of our findings in more detail. This is really something I should have done in the original video but we still thought it was well worth revisiting the Corsair one to show you this thermal data before moving on. The first thing to cover then is related to the fan curves for CPU and GPU in the Corsair One, as this is immediately one point of difference we found in our testing versus what DeBauer showed in his video. So in his video, DeBauer said that about halfway through, he actually got a fan curve update from Corsair, which adjusted fan behavior. As it turns out, my sample shipped with this update from the very beginning, so all of my testing was done with that update already applied, and that likely does explain a fair few thermal differences. For instance, DeBauer initially showed idle fan speeds of about 1400 RPM for the CPU and about 1000 RPM for the GPU, resulting in high idle noise in his video, whereas I saw idle fan speeds of around 700 RPM for both CPU and GPU, and like I said in the video, I did find it to be pretty quiet while idling. The different fan curves likely can also explain other thermal differences we saw when running Cinebench R23, where DeBauer showed his CPU around 95 to 96 degrees on the package, whereas in my version, after a 30 minute stress test, the temperature was only between around 83 to 86 degrees. So a fair difference there, and again, that could well be down to the different fan behavior. On this topic as well, it is a fair criticism that there are no user adjustable fan curves with the Corsair One. I did mention this to Corsair and they said they are working on implementing different profiles like you might get with a laptop, so like a quiet mode, a performance mode, a turbo mode, that sort of thing. Uh, they said that will be coming in a future update, but we have no idea when that will be and it's still early days for this system, but we will endeavor to check that out as and when it happens. I also wanted to rerun a bunch of different gaming tests, which is something I always do for a pre-built system review. I just didn't do a very good job of explaining where I was getting my figures from when talking about thermal performance. So what you're going to see here is a 30 minute stress test of Cyberpunk 2077 at 4K using ultra settings. And we've got HW info up, which is going to give us a live readout of both the CPU and GPU metrics. It's also worth saying that ambient temperature this week has been a little bit higher. So in my office, it's been 23 degrees compared to 20 degrees when I did my original testing. But everything you're about to see has been redone for this video. And I've also put the Corsair dashboard up on screen as well. So you can see a live readout of the fan speeds. For the CPU then, after our 30 minute stress test, we can see CPU package power at around 160 watts, with the CPU clocks bouncing from between 5.3 to 5.7 gigahertz. No doubt about it, this CPU is running warm, but it is remaining under 95 degrees, though earlier in the run you did see it did peak at 95C. The CPU core thermal throttling indicator has flicked on during the test, but considering the CPU is still clocking well over 5 GHz as we saw, the performance overall does look fine. As for the GPU, this is really no problem. Package power is showing a touch under 380 watts, but a GPU temperature of around 62C and a hotspot that's about 10 degrees higher is a very solid result for a 4090, and the same goes for the memory thermals of around 82 degrees. You can also see that those system fans are close to 2000 RPM and from a 30 centimeter distance, that sounds a bit like this. In hindsight then, I definitely underestimated how problematic this sort of noise level would be for the vast majority of users out there, and that is my mistake. Thermal behavior overall is just about okay for the CPU, about 90 degrees, if not slightly higher, but for the 4900K as it goes, we have seen worse. Clearly though, the CPU fans and system fans running at full pelt is a big reason as to why these thermals are just about in check, and if you are spending £4,700 on a pre-built system, 
it is safe to say you're going to want a cool and quiet experience and there's just no way the Corsa 1 will give you a quiet experience as the high power components in the diminutive chassis just means those fans really have to spin up, though we will test swapping them out for 25mm thick fans later in the video. That does, however, lead me on to my second point about the fans and their labelling. As you might have seen from De Bauer's video, he suggested that the fans were maybe plugged in incorrectly as the labelling within Corsair dashboard didn't make a whole lot of sense. And I did my own quick experiment to find out exactly which fan was which. So I'm just gonna quickly check if the fans match up to what we saw in the Debauer video and see if they are, I guess, mislabeled is probably the, the best thing. So first of all, I'm gonna stop this one here. And as we can see, that has stopped CPU fan two. And I'll get that one going again. Whereas this one on the right, if I stop that, that stops GPU fan two, which does seem a bit odd. And there's this one at the bottom, I stop that. And now we've stopped a GPU fan three. We've got these two fans on the top as well. They're obviously exhausting through the 240 milliliter all-in-one that is used for the GPU. If I stop this one here on the left, that stopped CPU fan one. And if I stop this one here, that stopped GPU fan one. Based on that clip then, the fan labeling doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. And I did reach out to Corsair about this, but they actually said a pretty interesting thing. And I'm gonna quote them directly. So I'm just gonna pull up my notes. They said that the fan labeling is based on location of airflow rather than where each fan is connected to which AIO. And that it's not a mistake with the assembly of the system. To see then if it would make any difference if we switch the fan connections around, that's exactly what I did, just unplugging them and replugging them as you can see here. And just to try now, as you can see here by the slightly messier cables, I have now switched it. So both fans on the top, these are both now labeled as GPU fans, whereas these two fans here are both now labeled as CPU fans. And we're just gonna test it, see if that makes any difference to thermals. As it turns out, this is a complete non-issue as we saw CPU thermals were still in the mid to high 80s during 30 minutes of Cyberpunk 2077 and we again saw the same peak of 95 degrees during the test. The GPU also showed basically no difference in thermal performance and as you are about to see and hear, noise levels were also unaffected. Moving on though, one other key area I really wanted to expand on from my original video is the GPU VRM situation. As I pointed out, there are no heat sinks or anything like that for the VRMs on this RTX 4090. Instead, they are just completely uncovered and rely solely on system chassis airflow for their cooling. Now, I did think this was pretty odd in my video, but without the right hardware, I was unable to test my hypothesis and find out exactly how hot these VRMs are running. Well, I since acquired a thermometer with two K-type thermocouples and I attached these to MOSFETs on the GPU, one on the left-hand side of the GPU core and then one on the right side, so we can see exactly how hot they are running. For testing, I again used Cyberpunk at 4K, but this time with path tracing enabled just to increase GPU power as high as I could, and that did see power reporting around 420 watts, so a pretty intense load. As you can see here, we saw temperatures of up to 74 degrees on the left-hand side of the GPU, and then 63 degrees on the right-hand side. Now, I also tried 3 d Mark Speedway, running a 30-minute stress test, which also saw power draw of over 420 watts, and this saw slightly higher temperatures of 75 degrees and 66 degrees, depending on the location of the thermocouple. To see exactly how problematic or not these temperatures are, I had a quick look online and I found out that the MOSFETs used by this specific 4090 are on semis NCP 302150 MOSFETs and the manufacturer rates these up to 150 degrees junction temperature based on this data sheet here. So even the peak of closer to 90 degrees that DeBauer saw in his testing is technically well within spec. Even with that said though, I just don't think relying solely on chassis airflow for a 450 watt graphics card is a good idea. 
After all, I'm testing a brand new machine in a relatively cool environment. Give it a year or two to get nice and dusty. Maybe you're in a hotter ambient environment and what if the lower fan fails and you don't realize it? I think it's just asking for trouble, particularly considering the cost of this system. I personally think Corsair should have implemented something like the MSI Supreme Liquid X, which is a hybrid cooler, so it's still got a 240mm all-in-one handling the GPU and memory, but it just needs some kind of heat sinks with an additional fan for those VRMs. For me, considering the price, this is just an unnecessary corner to cut, and I just don't see what it achieves considering just how expensive this machine is. I also want to touch on those two intake fans on the fan bracket at the top of the system, as you can see here. These are slim 15 millimeter units, and while I didn't touch on this in my original video, some additional testing has definitely showed that these could definitely be better. Swapping them out for full size 25 millimeter fans does make a difference. To prove this, I swapped in two Noctua NF F12 fans, which are rated at 2000 RPM, which is basically the same speed that these system fans were running at anyway. Firstly, you can see just how much bigger they look than the stock fans from the Corsair One, but I was still able to install them on that fan bracket and it closed up no problem at all. In terms of the thermal difference then, the CPU was typically in the high 70s to low 80s region when testing with these thicker fans, and we can also see that it peaked at 92 degrees, which is down from the 95 degree peak we saw with the stock fans. As mentioned, these are 2000 RPM fans, which is about the same speed the stock fans were running at anyway. That does mean we didn't see much, if any, reduction in noise, maybe just a slight difference as it was hovering around 47 decibels, as you can see and hear now. In a similar vein then, I also wanted to see what difference it would make if we use an entirely different CPU cooler. So I took DeBow's suggestion and grabbed a Noctua NH-D9L. I did actually want to try the U12A, but it was just slightly too large, so I settled for the more compact option. Even with those same 25mm Noctua fans installed and the NH-D9L cooler, I actually saw worse thermals than with the 120mm all-in-one. The CPU hit 100 degrees peak during my testing in Cyberpunk 2077 and was regularly in the mid to high 90s and the CPU was even clocking slightly lower so this is definitely worse than the stock configuration of the system in my testing here. Even then though the GPU thermals are barely affected and that certainly suggests to me that the 240mm all-in-one is doing its job well and would be no problem at all were it not for the uncovered VRMs. Overall then, based on the data I have shown you in this video, I personally think it's safe to say that the 4900K being cooled by the 120mm all-in-one with slim fans is technically okay, largely thanks to the CPU's 200W PL1 power limit, but it's definitely not a good solution considering it is still tragically loud and the CPU temperatures are approaching 90 degrees, if not higher. Now, I personally can't see Corsair ever using an air cooler in the Corsair One. I think for them it's probably just a lot easier on a mass scale to install an all-in-one liquid cooler instead of an air cooler, and it also takes up a lot less room on the inside of the system. However, my question to Corsair would be, why not a 240mm all-in-one with proper 25mm fans? That would significantly improve CPU thermals, likely also reducing noise levels, and there is definitely space for it on this fan bracket. So to me, that does just seem like another corner has been cut. Just before closing out this video then, I do just have two more points I want to mention which are a bit random, but I did see a few comments so I wanted to clarify a few things. The first then is in regards to IQ. As we pointed out in the original video, IQ is not installed on the system by default and it is not used to control any parameters of the Corsair One, which does make a change from previous versions of the Corsair One. However, you can still download IQ just like you would on any other PC and install it. So if you do have any other Corsair peripherals or anything like that, you can still grab IQ and it will work just fine. You do just need to download it yourself. The other point then is about some confusion we saw about upgrading the system yourself, particularly in regards to those I'm going to call them shiny stickers on the internals, which may look like warranty void stickers. 
However, I did check with Corsair and they confirmed to me that they are not warranty void if removed stickers. Instead, they are purely indicator stickers for their RMA team. So if you send the system back, they just quickly know if it's been opened up or not. I checked with Corsair again and the system has primarily been designed for upgrades to the storage and the memory and you will not void your warranty if you do open up the insides of the Corsair one to install a new SSD or swap out the memory or anything like that. So just wanted to clear that up. So that is really going to do it then for this revisit slash extra testing slash follow up to our original Corsair one i500 review from earlier in the week. After we saw a bunch of your comments on the original video, I just wanted to make this so you can see all of the testing we would normally do for a pre-built system review, and then also do a bunch more testing like the GPU VRMs that I wasn't able to do in the original video. It's safe to say then from all the testing we have shown in this video that the Corsair One definitely could improve in regards to its cooling, particularly with the CPU. While the 4900K is technically just about okay with CPU temperatures at around 90 degrees, it is still incredibly loud as we showed, hitting between 48 to 49 decibels. And I really did underestimate just how many people would find this problematic. But I think that is absolutely fair. If you are spending £4,700 on a system, you are going to want a cool and quiet experience, which the Corsair one just does not achieve. And I really think Corsair should have gone for a 240mm all-in-one for the CPU using proper 25mm fans. Aside from switching to 25mm fans, which as we showed earlier in the video does make a difference, I think the other thing Corsair could have done would be to not use the 4900K, which is a notoriously hot and power hungry CPU. Something like the Ryzen 7 7800X 3D would still be a top tier option for gaming. You might lose some multi-threaded performance, but considering this is primarily a gaming machine anyway, I don't think that matters but it is significantly easier to cool and that would result in lower noise levels as well. But that is really all I have to say about the Corsair One. I really hope you appreciated this extra in-depth analysis and revisit to our thermal testing. And if you've got any more questions about how we test or why we test, do let me know down in the comments below. That's it for this one though, guys. I've been Dominic for Kit Guru. If you liked it, please do toss me a thumbs up, hit subscribe, ding that notification bell, all that YouTube stuff. If you want to chat with us on our Discord server, you can find that linked in the description, as well as a link to our merch store, and you can even consider backing us on Patreon. That's it for this one though, guys. Like I said, I'm Dominic for Kit Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.